good morning good afternoon good evening depending upon uh, the, uh, depending upon which part of the world you are um, very very happy to talk about uh, one of the largest implementation of uh, blockchain in the world um, before i get into the subject uh, in, in terms of how we are leveraging blockchain for unsolicited commercial communication which is primarily spam calls and spam text uh, when i was speaking at uh, hyperledger foundation up early this year in the month of uh, march there was a media panel that was moderated by uh, by a gentleman from forbes i think his name is michael and uh, michael had asked a question uh, to me on that particular media panel when will be the point of arrival when uh, you can use blockchain and then you can pull out a let use from a neighborhood store and say that this let use is safe because it has been tracked on blockchain and there are no genetically modified ingredients or this particular let use uh, head has not been grown organic uh, has been has been grown organically and has not been grown in organically so i told him michael uh, i don't know when that uh, that will come but if you're talking about blockchain impacting the common man on the street and uh, blockchain being uh, leveraged from a social good and from a social impact i told him to come over to india and when you come to india and if you take a sim card from any of the local telco companies and then uh, i can tell you that after you have taken the sim card i can tell you that you are being insulated from spam calls and spam text by using the blockchain solution um in terms of uh, you know as we know spam is invading the handsets globally i thought that uh, spam is a problem that has been invented in india but when i started uh, traveling to different uh, places speaking in various forums about this particular implementation a lot of people have told me that uh, spam calls and spam text is a global problem for instance in united kingdom a lot of people get unsolicited calls on their landlines in uh, in united states a lot of people get robo calls the robo calls are either for technical support or they are for uh, you know uh, uh, trying to cheat people on the pretext of irs uh, filings so it is a global problem and this global problem needs to be tackled uh, and needs to be tackled especially using emerging technologies because the traditional technologies have failed simply in terms of tackling the problem so in uh, india as well uh, uh, spam has reached um, you know a very heightened uh, proportion uh, and people were completely vexed because they were getting more spam calls rather than the normal calls or normal text messages uh, to put things in perspective on an average an indian telco subscriber receives about uh, 10 to 20 spam text messages every day and probably 10 calls every every day and uh, when when this became a problem people started complaining to telcos telcos have not been that efficient in providing a solution for the spam calls and spam text because they were not sharing information with each other i will explain that in a bit but before that uh, there have been a lot of cases in india when these uh, when these innocent or gullible spam text messages seemingly innocent uh, uh, text messages were causing a lot of financial crime and you may wonder how how a small text message can lead to financial crime uh, this was primarily by a couple of uh, not couple many smart operators uh, who used to for, who used to send text messages maybe to 50000 people or 100000 people asking them to invest in a particular script on the stock exchange saying that uh, this script is going to break the circuit and then they have to they can invest in that or they should invest in that particular uh, particular script or stock because it is going to break the circuit and it will it is going to witness a bull run and uh, when when people who are recipient of that messages out of 100000 maybe 10000 think that it is not a spam text because that particular message or text has come from a telco uh, so they believe that uh, it is a it is a genuine message somebody is trying to give them tips 
uh, in terms of investing. And uh, out of these uh, people, probably 5,000 people or 10,000 people will go and invest in that particular stock. And the person who has sent that stock obviously is sitting on a lot of that stock. And since uh, there is a demand, sudden demand for the stock on the stock exchange, uh, there is a bull run. And the bull run results in appreciation of the stock price. And when the stock price appreciates, the person who is sitting on that stock offloads and they make a killing and then they vanish. So this has been happening for quite uh, some time. And eventually the uh, consumers, which are basically the telco subscribers, they have gone and complained to the telco. And they have also gone and complained to the consumer court saying that uh, we've complained to the telcos and telcos are not that effective in providing a solution. And when the, when the court intervened and asked for, uh, uh, asked for an explanation, then they called, uh, they called the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which is basically the government body regulating uh, telecommunications in India, equivalent of Ofcom, Office of Communications in UK, or Federal Communications Corporation in the United States. And uh, when TRAI was called for an explanation, then TRAI convened uh, the meeting of all the telcos. Then the telcos simply blamed, saying that, uh, hey, we are the terminating provider. I mean, uh, technically, they are called as terminating access provider. That means the calls are terminating onto the network or the text messages are terminating to the subscribers on the network, but these messages or calls have originated uh, from an alternate network, which is called as an OP, originating access provider. So, uh, so for example, if there is telco A and telco B, and telco B customers have complained that telco B um, figures that the messages have actually come from someone who has taken subscription from telco A. And then they would either tell the subscribers to go and lodge the complaint to Telco A, which becomes a nightmare kind of an experience because uh, the, you don't, you're not a subscriber of that particular Telco. So the ability to access the uh, customer care is very, very, um, is, is, is basically long drawn process. It is uh, painful and uh, you cannot uh, reach, reach them on short codes because you don't belong to the uh, network. And um, when they go to the telco A and then say, hey, this uh, traffic has originated uh, from your network, can you tell us the details of the people who have borrowed these connections, I mean, who have subscribed for these connections, primarily taking uh, the SIM connections? And they would say, you know, these guys were active about a month ago, and then uh, they have recently, they became inactive. And uh, from the documents that they have produced in terms of uh, KYC documents, we are not able to trace them. So they're basically fly-by-night operators who, be, uh, who give wrong documents and then indulge in the spam messages, spam calls and spam text. They remain active probably for a month or so. And when the complaints peak, they basically throw those uh, SIM cards and move to an alternate uh, network. So they're basically nomads moving from one particular network to another network. So when the telcos were shifting the blame on, on each other or putting the blame on each other, the regulator said, this cannot happen this way. And then they asked the telco saying, what is that we need to do to overcome this problem? Then the telco said, we need to share information. And the regulator asked them, okay, go ahead and share the information. The telcos came back and said, hey, hey, this is the information pertaining to our subscribers. Uh, we don't know how our competitors are going to use this particular information. I'm okay to give the information provided I get visibility as to how that information is being used by an another telco operator. That means uh, they had to archive all the information on a shared ledger. And then they also not only archive the information on the shared ledger, but they also have to gain visibility as to how that particular information is being used by different participants or people who have access to that uh, shared ledger. And when the regulator said, okay, let's, uh, uh, let's look into what kind of technologies can solve this. And this was almost about three years ago. 
and uh, and the regulator called for uh, uh, ideas. They basically called for papers from an open consultation perspective. And uh, during that particular process, three tech majors have responded to that call from the regulator. Uh, one is Microsoft, second is Tech Mahindra, and the third one is IBM. And three these three tech majors responded to the regulator and the, uh, the research wing of the regulator also did their homework and they said that probably a distributed ledger technology will be able to meet their requirements. And uh, we've agreed, all the three people, all the three companies agreed with the regulator saying that yes, distributed ledger technology seems to have that promise not only from a perspective of sharing the data, but also giving a complete visibility to what, to what happens to the data on the network, number one. And then they had various other requirements as well, which I will explain in a bit. And uh, based on those requirements, all the three tech majors have narrowed down on DLT. And um, then Microsoft uh, was looking for a partner uh, so we aligned with uh, Microsoft and IBM wanted to go on their own. So it eventually narrowed down to IBM, Microsoft plus uh, Tech Mahindra. And the regulator asked us to demonstrate proof of concept and proof of technology, which we have been able to demonstrate that. And once we have demonstrated the proof of concept and proof of technology, the regulator has come up with a set of guidelines called as uh, UCC unsolicited commercial communication guidelines. And this particular uh, guidelines had an approach plan in terms of what are the various functionalities that need to be on the distributed ledger or blockchain? Uh, what will be the experience of the end customer? How, how should they be insulated? And what are the various steps that a telco needs to take and also the uh, telemarketer who are who are uh, the telemarketer or telemarketers who are affiliated to the telco need to take. Uh, so now I've explained in terms of uh, the financial crime aspects, but not all text messages contribute to the financial crime. The text messages uh, contribute to simple nuisance. I may get text completely on automobiles while I don't need automobile. I may get text on uh, uh, on loans while I may not need loan. I may get text on holidays while I may not need holidays. So the regulator said that first to streamline, what we need to do is we need to uh, gather what is called as consent. And we also need to gather what is called as a preference. So consent, for example, you know, if I take my example and I'm in, I'm shopping or I'm in the market shopping for a car, then I would go and say that, hey, I would like to receive text messages from automobile manufacturers. That is my consent. And in that consent, I can also go to a granular level and I can say, while I'm open to receive information from automobile manufacturers, I'm, I'm looking at only a particular class of SUV and that particular class of SUV is limited, let's say to a Toyota or Ford. Uh, that level of granularity is also possible. That is the consent information. Now the preference. The preference is primarily, I would say, uh, I don't want to receive this particular text message whenever you want to send it. I want to receive it in a predefined interval. So I can define maybe weekday or I can define maybe weekend. And then I may define saying that uh, on a weekday, I'm okay to receive this message probably from four to five o'clock or on a weekend, probably uh, from 11 to 12 a.m. in the morning. But I don't want to receive these messages uh, in time zones outside the uh, time zone that I have selected for. So this consent information and the preference information for every subscriber has to be collected by the telco. They collect that information by via an app. And once that information is collected, this information has to be replicated across all the telcos. Uh, because uh, telco B will collect information pertaining only to their subscribers. Now, if, if a marketeer 
wants to send message from Telco B because they are affiliated to Telco B or they have taken subscription services from Telco B. And now they have to send messages to subscribers who belong to Telco A. So the Telco A consent and preference information needs to be accessed by these marketeers who are on the Telco B network. So every Telco by virtue of that has to share that information. And this information has to be replicated across the telcos in a real time basis, or maybe a particular with a particular lag. And this information has to be archived so that everybody can access that information. So it has been designed in such a, uh, such a manner that uh, consent information is archived on the blockchain and the preference information may be archived or may not be archived on blockchain. It can be off the chain because that information may be humongous. So those are the two important aspects. The other thing is in terms of um, the telemarketers uh, have to come through a telco. They cannot come directly. So they cannot, uh, a, a no telemarketer is allowed to set up their own blockchain node directly on this particular blockchain network. They have to come through a telco. The nodes are managed by the, uh, by the telco. The, uh, and before a message is sent, uh, the message or a, or a call is made, they are subjected to what is called as a scrubbing. Uh, from us, uh, I'll explain in terms of what is uh, what is scrubbing. Scrubbing is primarily suppose a telemarketer comes and says that uh, I have to send hundred thousand messages to these. Uh, I mean, one message for uh, one message each for hundred thousand subscribers. So it is hundred thousand messages, and this messages pertain to a new launch of luxury sedan, and they go to the telco and they give the a mobile numbers of all the people to whom the message has to go. Now the telco cannot send the messages just like that. The telco has to take all those mobile numbers and they perform scrubbing. And they basically by virtue of scrubbing, they are validating whether these 100,000 numbers have actually said yes to receive information on a luxury sedan. And have they said yes to receive information, let's say from Lexus brand. And that process of validation is called as scrubbing. And when they do the scrubbing, uh, they're basically comparing the consent and the preference information, which is there on the blockchain network and off the blockchain network. And when they do that validation, the telco may find that 80,000 numbers confined to that rule set, whereas 20,000 numbers do not confine to the rule set. So they drop those 20,000 numbers and they tokenize all the mobile numbers and then they communicate to the telemarketer saying, you gave 100,000 numbers. Out of the 100,000 numbers, 80,000 numbers meet the consent and the preference criteria based on the scrubbing we did. And since only 80,000 uh, numbers meet the requirement, we are able to deliver only 80,000 numbers. And the marketeer doesn't know which number went through and which number didn't went through because we don't want them to do social engineering and then try to figure out what consent and preference information is there pertaining to the subscribers. So, uh, so the second element that is required is tokenization of the mobile numbers using SHA protocol or whatever is the protocol. And then once the numbers are tokenized, and the number, I mean, you're basically uh, pseudofying the, uh, the telephone number as far as the marketeer is concerned. And then all those numbers, 80,000 numbers which pass through, they are aggregated. And once they are aggregated, and another token is generated by the originating access provider. Now, this token, along with the numbers, is exchanged on the blockchain network with the terminating access provider. And when the terminating access provider gets this information, they don't just push the messages through. They don't just push the calls through because they also need to perform the algorithm. 
and they perform the algorithm again based on the consent information and the preference information and the scrubbing that has been done. And then they ensure if 80,000 members pass through the algorithm, pass through the checks and the balances. And if they pass through the checks and balances, then those 80,000 numbers get delivered. And if, if, the, if the marketeer uh, defaults, or if the telco defaults, and if there is a customer complaint, the complaint gets archived on the blockchain network. And the regulation basically tells that the telcos are responsible for compliance. It doesn't matter even if the telemarketeers are at fault, uh, because eventually the responsibility of scrubbing, the responsibility of uh, comparing the consent information and the preference information that is archived on the blockchain network is with the telcos. And if the telcos are at fault, and if a complaint is raised, the telco is expected to take an action against the telemarketeer within 24 hours. The action would be basically a warning. And in spite of the warning, if, uh, if the compliances are not met and if they continue to, uh, if they are repeat offenders, then they have to constrain the calling facility on their numbers to just about two calls per day. And they have to constrain the text messaging capability to just to two text messages per day. And if they don't do that, then the telco will run a risk of paying a fine as high as $10,000 per every day of delay. And entire thing is archived on the blockchain network because telco A is repeatedly complaining to telco B saying that they are defaulting. They're not complying with the TRAI UCC guidelines as a result of which you know they need to be penalized. And this entire blockchain network the regulator also has an observatory node so that they can see what's happening in the network. So this gives you a perspective of the architecture in terms of the DLT network, uh, wherein you have all the, all the operating systems of the telco provider, as well as the BSS systems of the telco provider. So you, you have the modules uh, that take care of identity and access management. You have an Active Directory module. There is an SMSE center. Uh, then there is uh, the CRM uh, engines in which the subscriber information is archived. And when the subscribers, if the subscribers have moved from one network to another network because of the mobile number portability, they don't end up changing the numbers. Uh, so you, you may want to perform that check also to figure out saying that to which telco they actually belong to. So all these components are, uh, are included. And then, as I said before, uh, the blockchain nodes are set up by, by the respective, uh, respective telco and, and, and the architecture pertaining to the, uh, to the blockchain is maintained by the respective, uh, respective telco. Uh, in terms of, uh, this is an additional de details in terms of the how the architecture looks like. Uh, so you uh, so you have ATEL, which is one of the operator. They have they have the node. They have an orderer, peer, and a central authority, and then they have deployed uh, this on premise. Uh, Tata is an uh, another uh, telco operator. Uh, they have deployed uh, it on the Azure cloud environment. Uh, Arcom is an another telco operator. They have also deployed it on Azure cloud environment. Reliance Geo is an another operator. Uh, they have deployed it on Zio's Azure cloud. And then Odafone and Idea is an another operator where they have used AWS cloud services. And there's there are others, uh, other small operator called QTL. They have used on-premise. BSNL, which is the government incumbent government owned uh, telecom operator they have used a third party aws cloud and this gives you a complete perspective of how the entire dlt network for these telcos uh, telcos look like and then the entire thing when it comes together it constitutes the consortium the complete consortium to get into the technical details 
many of them have used uh, Hyperledger Fabric version 1.4.2 because all of them have started implementation almost about uh, uh, eight to two, um, about I think about eight to twelve months ago. And uh, the number of smart contracts that run on the network are about uh, 13 of them, 13 each uh, for each of the telco. Uh, they've used Go language for the smart contract. Uh, uh, I mean, the technology stack is Go language. Uh, each of the telco has uh, 12 channels. And then they have three applications, which are primarily the subscriber management. Uh, the entity registration. Entity registration is primarily applicable to the telemarketeers and then the complete telecom operations that belong to an incumbent telco. And each of the telco have two nodes. And, and I mentioned to you about uh, cloud technology. In fact, because of this cloud uh, technology, uh, uh, this particular implementation can also easily uh, get qualified or classified as the world's largest implementation of blockchain using a multi-cloud environment. And why do I say world's largest implementation? Because if you look at India, uh, currently there are 1.2 billion subscribers in India. Out of the 1.2 billion subscribers, there are 100, uh, 800 million active subscribers. And if you do the math about 10 spam calls per day and 10 spam texts per day, you can uh, you can imagine in terms the amount of uh, transactions that are going to be processed out of, uh, I mean, through this particular implementation. And currently, most of the telcos are at uh, TPS of 176. I had mentioned to you before that uh, it's not necessary to archive all the information on chain, because if you archive all the information on on chain for 800 million subscribers, you're talking about huge amount of storage on on chain, which makes the entire processing capacity slower. And it also requires humongous amount of data storage. So from that perspective, we have used a combination of on chain and off chain, I will explain to you how we have used it. And we have used uh, elastic search as a capability to facilitate off-chain and on-chain on storage. Now to explain how the off-chain and on-chain storage happens, uh, before, um, uh, you know, I mentioned to you about scrubbing, wherein every subscriber consent and preference information has to be checked before the message is delivered or before the call is made. That process of scrubbing can be stored off the chain. Uh, you don't have to store every minute detail of scrubbing on the chain. And once you once you store that information of the chain and you connect the systems in which that information is stored, if somebody wants to go down and do an audit, they can access those systems offline, off, I mean, off the chain, and then they can validate whether the scrubbing process has been completely adhered to or not adhered to. However, the aspect that the scrubbing has been completed, as a result of which a legitimate call can be made to the customer or a legitimate message can be delivered to the customer, that portion is archived on the chain. So by using this combination of, of the chain and the on the chain, we are able to accomplish huge amount of data capabilities. And as I mentioned to you, in terms of, you know, it's a first multi-hybrid uh, multi -hybrid cloud and on uh, a combination of on-prem and uh, cloud setup. Obviously, it's one of the largest scale network, uh, which brings in, again, a unique combination of on-chain and off-chain uh, processing. And there is a control sharing of the content pertaining to the users, pertaining to the subscribers between different telco operators. Um, you know, you can also ensure that uh, the content can be read only by the terminating access provider and the originating access provider by using a combination of symmetric and asymmetric keys. And what is more important is it results in a real time integration with various telecom network elements uh, to accomplish what I call as the do not disturb checks, uh, because 
you know, if people go and register, do a blanket, do not disturb. That means they're, they're, they're not open to receive even a single text message. Even though the telemarketer would have acquired the uh, consent, uh, then you have to respect the uh, uh, do not disturb provisions that have been set up by the subscriber. And then it also ensures that the telemarketers and principal entities can interoperate between different telecom operators. Um, they can scrub with one operator and uh, even while the delivery is with the other operator, as I've, as I've explained, explained to you. And then it, the blockchain as a technology is integrated to a cross section of technology landscape of the telecom operators. And as I've shown you in the architecture diagram, it has been integrated with multiple telco OSS and BSS uh, components, which is either the CRM or the short messaging gateway, Active Directory or security gateway or whatever are the underlying, uh, underlying systems. So in, in a sense, what we are basically saying is Initially, when there were complaints, the complaints used to take anywhere between uh, two to thirty days to resolve, and many of many of the complaints get uh, remained unresolved because of this blame game that I mentioned to you before. But now, uh, the cycle time uh, to manage those complaints will get reduced tremendously, and everybody has a complete transparency. Uh, nobody can blame the other telco operator. Uh, and say that they are flouting the rules while uh, while they themselves, I mean, the incumbent uh, telco is adhering to the rules. That aspect is eliminated completely. So there is no trust deficit. And in addition to that, uh, since everybody can see all the information, there is a good amount of traceability that is available on the network. And also, as I mentioned to you, the regulator also has an observatory note. Uh, as far as the live implementations, uh, Reliance Geo, Tata Teleservices, and Reliance Communications um, are, the, are the telcos who are working with us. And uh, for Reliance Geo, we have used many functionalities into enterprise grade implementation. Uh, so is the case with uh, Tata Teleservices, and so is the case with uh, Reliance Communication. In essence, Tech Mahindra is catering to about 50% of uh, the active subscriber base or greater than 50% of the active subscriber base. And no wonder this uh, particular implementation has been recognized not only in India, but also has been recognized globally as a sensible blockchain solution, a scalable blockchain solution, and a solution that is impacting the lives of the people. And it is not an esoteric blockchain solution whose impact cannot be measured or whose impact cannot be quantified. Uh, so, uh, so we've been uh, recognized by Microsoft because initially we have partnered with Microsoft. We have used Microsoft technology stack to a great extent. And we have received a worldwide runners up award from Microsoft under the Microsoft Inspire category. The Indian Blockchain Association has also awarded us. This association runs under the AGs of Accenture and they have, uh, they have awarded uh, us for uh, a sensible implementation under the category of blockchain for social good or blockchain for social impact. Uh, the National Association of Software and Services Company, which is the services companies, which is the mouthpiece of IT and ITS industry in India, have also recognized this as a very innovative solution using blockchain in their annual technology uh, awards. Uh, you know, they, they have technology awards every year, and it was recognized in the year 2019. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll pause here. Hopefully I've given you a good perspective of how it works. And hopefully I have uh, demystified. Uh, uh, if, I, if I made things more mystified and not demystified them, happy to answer your questions and then, and then clarify any doubts that you may have. Thank you, uh, Rajesh. This is great. It was very interesting. Um, 
a question from an anonymous at attendee. Uh, is this network live? Is it capable of interoperability? Also, is this plat uh, platform capable of data purge, which is a legal requirement for telcos? Right. So the uh, the complete network of all the participating telcos is still not live because some of the telcos have been lagging behind implementation and some of them have also got a waiver uh, from the telecom regulatory authority uh, citing difficulties in implementation, especially uh, implementing blockchain technology, as a result of which uh, some of those operators uh, are still not live on the network, but majority of the operators, many, many functionalities that I mentioned to you, consent, preferences, scrubbing, all those functionalities are live from, a, uh, from an enterprise uh, grade perspective. Uh, here, interoperability uh, is become a little redundant because uh, all of them have went in favor of uh, Hyperledger Fabric because uh, uh, nobody wanted to use uh, public stack of blockchain or a public protocol of blockchain. They wanted to use a permission uh, technology uh, as a result of which the choice was narrowed down to Hyperledger Fabric as a result of which there is no a uh, real interoperability challenge uh, per se. Uh, from a data purge perspective, sorry, I didn't understand the exact nature of the question. Um, in terms of whatever the telcos are doing, they are in compliance with the KYC guidelines, and they're also in compliance with the data disclosure norms that are, that are available within the country. So from that particular perspective, uh, there is no conflict from our data disclosure norms or disclosing uh, the uh, personal identifiable information. The only personal identifiable information that is going to be disclosed here is the consent and the preference information and customers have signed up for that voluntarily. They have not only signed up for that voluntarily, but they also give that uh, what we call as uh, implicit consent. And how it happens is, for example, over the weekend you are touring the mall, the very good promotion that is happening probably on furniture or on housing or on holidays, you fill up a form and then you give your mobile number and you also say that you're okay to receive calls. That is called as an implicit consent. And if the telemarketer is able to come up and show the documentary evidence of that implicit consent until and unless the subscriber has not uh, uh, has not opted for a blanket DND. Those messages can be delivered. So that's how this entire process works. So there is nothing that is going to happen in dissonance with the data disclosure norms pertaining to the end subscribers. Right, that makes uh, sense. Um, so uh, the, just a follow up to that question by data purge, um, the yeah. question was meant to be data archival after a certain timeline. This would be an issue for the data stored on fabric. Yeah, absolutely. So the way it happens is uh, customers also keep changing their consent information dynamically because uh, they don't want to give consent to everyone. And if they keep their consent open to everyone, they will go back to the original situation. And now they can't even complain because uh, all the telemarketers have acquired their consent information. So what we expect from a customer behavior, uh, since most of their requirements are tactical, uh, once their requirement has been met, uh, we expect the customer, even if an additional redundant message is delivered, they would just go and revoke their consent. And once they revoke their uh, consent pertaining to a particular, uh, particular category of commercial message, uh, since that revocal has happened, it also, uh, uh, their information uh, of course, it in blockchain it is it is stored, but the telemarketers will not be able to access that information. From that particular perspective, we don't expect a misutilization. But in terms of yes, it is uh, etched into the blockchain uh, completely. Right. Thank okay. you. Uh, is there any specific reason why uh, did you go for Hyperledger Fabric rather than private Ethereum? 
Uh, private Ethereum, a couple of reasons. Many telcos didn't want to get into something which have tokens and uh, something, uh, a protocol which also uh, was used in the public domain. So because, and also in terms of uh, Ethereum perspective, you know, the, the TPS was also a problem. So considering all these aspects, uh, the telcos have made the decision in favor of Hyperledger Fabric. Probably the telcos were also being uh, guided by, you know, if I take an example from a cloud technology perspective, initially everybody wanted to use only the private aspects of the cloud. Nobody wanted to use the public aspects of the cloud because either it was considered initially to be insecure or the technologies have not evolved to a state where you could uh, secure anything that you are leveraging from a public stack or from a public infrastructure perspective. Because of those analogies, and because also kind of a rub off effect and also the inherent limitations from a Ethereum protocol perspective, everybody had made a decision in favor of a Hyperledger Fabric. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that makes, makes sense. Do you see yeah. these being repeated in other countries, as you uh, said, spam yeah, is a single problem? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Office, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, Ofcom, uh, which is, which is the regulator in UK, has studied the TRAI uh, model. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, they had uh, challenges in terms of spam calls on landlines. I I think that uh, problem still persists, and uh, there have been. Uh, there have been initiatives from British Telecom and the others to look at this particular model, but uh, nothing concrete has been uh, has been implemented from the end. Uh, at least I know FCC in the United States is looking at it uh, from a perspective of uh, robocalls. Uh, they have gone. They have taken a slightly different path. They have come up with something called as uh, stir and shaken. So they are basically in stir and shaken. You are using tokens, and then uh, you are uh, handling the assorted information through tokens in a secure fashion. But it does not have the elements of sharing of information between various telcos. So the approach that the U.S. telcos are taking, if you see a robocall, just shut it down. But they're not. Uh, taking an approach wherein they're saying, okay, this information has to be shared with uh, different telcos so that we not only shut down the robocall as and when it happens, but we completely eliminate it. Thus, that component can happen only when all the telcos come together and start sharing information using the using blockchain or DLT. And that we actually we put in as a recommendation through World Economic Forum and also through IBM and through other uh, through uh, through some other sources. And if they take that recommendation in, Stir and Shaken will also have the blockchain DLT component. Uh, in Middle East, uh, the UAE regulator has mandated both Etisalat as well as Do Telecom to basically look into the Indian model and then manage the uh, preference and consent information. This is primarily because, uh, uh, because when people come into the country and when they take, uh, when they're roaming on their network or when they take a local SIM, they don't want the experience of those transient uh, users of the telecom services to be bad because of the spam calls and spam text. So in Middle East, yes, the regulator has already mandated it for Etisalat and Do. And in other countries, for example, Saudi Arabia, uh, the telcos are evaluating it proactively. So I mentioned to you about telcos in UK, telcos in US, which are primarily driven by FCC, uh, telcos in Middle East, primarily driven by the regulator, and telcos in Saudi, not driven by the regulator, but driven by uh, by the telcos themselves. So these are the these are the different markets where see where we are seeing traction for this kind of service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's uh, yeah. So um, I see the uh, Brett Carpenter that wants to speak up. I'll give you voice in a second, Brett. One more question. Um, 
So someone saying, uh, thank you, fantastic use case. And what's next on the roadmap of, for this project? Uh, the next uh, on this roadmap for this project is at this point of time, the regulator has not uh, allowed the monetization of the information. Uh, I'll tell you how monetization can happen. So as a telco, I know that my subscriber has uh, said yes to consent, let's say from a luxury car. Um, and then he has also said to lifestyle holidays. So now I start making the sketch of their buying preferences. So here is a customer who seems to be very fond of luxury. So there may be ideal target for luxury housing. So by, by making that sketch, not through a second, not through information, which has been collated through indirect sources or by market research firms, but this is based on the information that I am acquiring directly from the subscribers. By, bring, by putting all that information together, I should have very good insights about the, uh, about the subscriber buying preference and buying behavior so that I'll be able to uh, come up with very effective marketing campaigns from an upsell and from a cross-sell perspective. That piece is going to come up at a later point of time, but now the regulator has strictly forbidden all the telcos to utilize that information for marketing purposes. When it comes, then the marketers will absolutely love it because they don't have to do syndicated market research or they don't have to get data from indirect sources they, they get data from direct sources and the ability of a hit is much higher on the direct sourced data. Yep. And we expect that to come up at a later point of time. Mm -hmm. So Brett, your turn. Uh, you're allowed to talk, speak. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Brett. Okay, thank you. Um, very, very, very nice presentation. Um, my name is Brett Carpenter and I am the Hyperledger organizer of Troy, Michigan. And um, my functions up to this point have been um, varying, but in large part, I'm very interested in policy. Yeah. And when I lived and when I lived when I lived in Maryland, I had access through uh, my 501c3 to um, to enter or, or um, work in the Library of Congress. And so I, I took a course and I learned how to make the codes and um, I was able to do some really deep dives. And as you well know, information isn't that easily gotten. And so could you make any recommendations for me to grab um, the policies that, yeah, I'm, sure. that I'm hearing sure, so, that I can, so that I can lobby my government for what I'm doing yeah. In Troy. Actually, I'm going to be a, doing a digital digital twinning of the entire county of right. Troy of, of Oakland County. That's right. you know that's right. Right. so. Brett, uh, when uh, U.S. Uh, President uh, Honorable Donald Trump visited India, he also brought in the FCC Chairman Ajit Pai. Uh, Ajit Pai has also visited India and he met with uh, the officials at TRAI. Uh, one was primarily to explore collaboration in the telecommunication space between both the countries. But uh, what caught Ajit Pai's attention was also this uh, UCC guidelines that we are talking about. In fact, we also wanted yeah. to do a proof of concept and proof of technology for FCC. Uh, FCC is relying at this point of time heavily with an organization called uh, IETF. It is uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. So if you go to ietf.org and you look for stir and shaken protocols, you will get a wealth of information from them. And what we will do is uh, through the organizers, we will also give you access to all the guidelines that uh, TRAI has also put it in the public domain. Even if it is not in public domain, we should be able to get you 30, 40 uh, page regulation that you could read. Thank you. Does that help, Brett? Oh, it really does. That, that is, that, I, just went, I just went in warp speed, you know, like Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you, thank you. 
I'm really happy that this is turning so productive. Um, so uh, another uh, anonymous attendee is asking, once the data is stored in a blockchain, it cannot be altered or removed. Uh, you are storing customer information in blockchain. Does this comply with the GDPR guideline? What if customers don't want to store this information and will be, how will it be removed from the blockchain? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. As I said before, uh, the information, uh, some part of information pertaining to customers is only available to the uh, telcos. So it is as good as, for example, your KYC information is with the telcos, which means your date of birth, ad your address details, your identification details, all of them are with the telco. And the telcos have to follow in terms of the uh, data non-disclosure norms. And since it's a permission blockchain, and since the telemarketeers cannot come directly onto the blockchain, they have to go through the gateway that is set up by the telco. Uh, the amount of information that uh, the others can access apart from the telcos or the staff of the telcos is very, very limited. And by by even even today in apps in absence of blockchain, you're storing all the subscriber personally identifiable information in the CRM systems of the telco, and and the access to that information is available to the telco uh, employees as well. But still, you are able to secure that uh, particular information, and that information is not going to be pushed out into the wild. The same concept. Uh, applies even to blockchain and even even then what information are we storing on blockchain we're just storing some constant information of the subscriber and the and the time of the week or the time of the day that they have said yes to the messages or to the calls so we're not storing mission critical information on blockchain so from that perspective already there is a layer of insulation and the second layer of insulation is that you're only storing consent and preference information of the customer. You're not archiving, um, you know, the uh, the date of birth or identification or KYC information of the customer on blockchain. So from that perspective, we don't see much of a challenge from a GDPR compliance aspects. Hopefully that answers your question. I I am uh, I think it is, it does. Um, uh, Satish uh, is asking how the governance part works. How does the governance part work? Uh, is yeah. the TRAI has the uh, final say and how the conflicts handle at the high level? Yeah, yeah. So basically, as you know, consortiums work uh, on a concept of team sport. Uh, so from that perspective, the regulator played a brilliant role here. First, they, uh, they framed the regulation and they told all the telcos to implement it or run the risk of paying uh, fines for non-implementation. Uh, so all the telcos had no option but to implement it. In fact, the telcos tried to circumvent this through, uh, through their organization called Cellular Operators Association of India. But ultimately, since it was for common good of all the subscribers, then uh, the Cellular Operators Association of India also has agreed to implement this. Uh, once, once they have given the initial momentum through the regulations, uh, the regulator said that uh, the future developments of the consortium have to be governed by what they call as COP, the code of practice. And the code of practice will define the do's and don'ts and the governance structure. So the telcos have to evolve this code of practice by themselves. And if the telcos are not able to reach a conclusion or they're not able to reach a consent, then the regulator is always available to disintermediate or you know, act as a mediator and then address uh, the conflicts. So uh, to give the initial momentum, they framed the regulation and the regulation gave the initial momentum, moved the telcos out of the inertia and then made them, uh, got them on the path to implement this. After that, they told all the telcos to come up with code of practices. So all the telcos have evolved a very detailed code of practice to ensure that the consortium works in a frictionless manner. And when a friction point arrives, and if the telcos are not able to address that through the code of practice, 
they can always go to the regulator for intervention. That's how the governance aspect works on this consortium. Great, thank you so much, Rajesh. This was amazing. There is one more question, and I will ask you to answer it with one word. Are you storing the mobile numbers of citizens? No, the mobile numbers of the citizens are not uh, not stored on uh, on blockchain. They're referred off the blockchain, and uh, and when when they are when they are moving on the blockchain, remember I told you about tokenization. So the mobile numbers are completely tokenized or the pseudo numbers are exchanged on the network and then uh, you can the telco will be able to decrypt uh, but the telemarketer will not be able to decrypt great thank you uh we are out of time which shows how good the discussion was thank you everyone for participating uh we have uh, upcoming webinars on the november 4th the, we will hear from ceo ledger on credit unions using member pass this will be an identity uh talk and then we will also have a talk from ibm on securing your open source blockchain project with ibm blockchain platform um, we have loads of content on our website and YouTube channel, so please check it out. And finally, please get involved. We love to hear from you and we would love uh, you to maybe become one of the next speakers. Thank you, stay safe, and we'll see you on November 4th. Great, fantastic. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I absolutely love the interaction. Thanks for all the questions they brought in an extra element of energy into this webinar.